Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our July webinar. I am Vinay Suram. I work as a research person and teacher educator at Ajim Premji Foundation. I also work as a field editor for I Wonder. For uh, those of you who are joining us for the first time, let me take a moment to introduce you I Wonder. I Wonder is a science magazine for middle and high school teachers. It features writings about the many dimensions of teaching and learning of science inside the classroom and outside it. This magazine is published in English, Hindi and Kannada twice a year. Also many of us and many of you may know that on every second Wednesday of every month, we invite the author of an article in I Wonder for a live discussion. Uh, if you would like to receive a free print version of each issue and updates of each monthly webinar, please subscribe to us by following the link displayed in the description of this video. If you are a practicing science teacher, please write to us. To do this, please send in your idea in less than 100 words to iwonder at apu.edu.in. You can also catch us on Facebook. Those of you who have subscribed to us know that our June 2022 issue had a snippet titled Studying a Balloon's Flight. So we have the author of the snippet with us today. Welcome, Anish. Thank you for joining with us today. Thank you, Vinay and I Wonder team for calling me here. Thank you, Anish. Let me take a moment to introduce uh, Anish here. Anish Mukashi's academic background is in experimental physics. He comes with a wealth of teaching experience. He currently works with physics and teacher education groups at Ajim Premji University, Bengaluru. He has previously taught school students at Purna Learning Center and undergraduate students at IISC Bangalore. He has also worked with Ekalavya Gopal on science teacher education. He is interested in connecting doing and thinking in the context of learning science, students' ideas and meaning making, cultures of teaching learning, and the history of science. Today we get to hear more about his experience with teaching and learning physics. So before we start, uh, I'll just share a brief of how the format is going to be. In the first 30 minutes of the discussion, I'll ask Kanish some questions that we have for him. You may have some questions for him to ask too. Please feel free to type them in the chat box as and when you think of them. Once we start receiving your questions, we will ask Anish for his responses to them. Uh, Anish, shall we start? Yes, Vinay. Yes, let's start. Yeah. So you mentioned that you choose to structure a class around balloons. After you had spotted balloons in the class, you know, this seems like a spontaneous decision. You know, could you uh, help us identify some factors that led you to take this decision? I, I'm not really sure. It's been a few years, but I think I could sense that the children were very keen to talk about balloons because they were on their tables and they were holding on to the balloons and just, I mean, it looked like they were having fun. And now mm. since the next teacher had come, like I was the next teacher, uh, typically the next teacher comes in with a different um, kind of agenda, right? Mm. So I chose to uh, kind of continue with whatever they were already engaged with and leave my plan because I thought that it'll be easy to, uh, I don't have to reorient them, you know, to another context that way. Okay. Because my, uh, I mean, my main motive for that class was to engage children with some uh, ideas in science, some phenomena, since it was also a science activity class and not a formal science class. Yeah. Okay. No, you may have been able to spontaneously come up with questions and activities related to balloons, but some teachers may feel more confident and see more value in choosing a more structured approach was designed before one steps into class. Now, how would you respond to this? I mean, are there any cases or situations where you two would have preferred a more structured approach? 
actually i agree gune actually generally i also like to have some structure but every time i enter a class i am i have to remind myself that okay i have come with a plan but uh what depending on what the students are going to respond how they are going to respond i may be, i may have to change my plan a bit you know depending on their uh, responses so i maybe a term that we can use is uh, structured spontaneity <laughs> <laughs> would be something that i would like to aim for as a teacher or spontaneously structured yeah <laughs> yeah sorry you were please can you know that that's it yeah so I, i agree with that yeah i would prefer structure of course okay so you mentioned that you stepped into this class to facilitate a science activity no would your preference of approaches have been different as a regular teacher i agree actually again you know because especially when you start teaching uh, in the higher grades even in an alternative school there are a uh, certain kind of anxieties right that people are dealing with especially how are children going to perform in an exam and so on so uh, yeah in a formal science class maybe there would be more structure but as a teacher who is interested in uh, children's ideas and making sure children uh, uh, who is interested in making sure that children engage with the subject matter deeply it should be meaningful for them personally right uh, even if there is some uh, looming examinations at the end of everything i think teachers uh, all teachers i'm sure who are interested in children and their ideas uh, want to keep that uh, spirit alive right of learning things in spite there can be structure but there can also be space for uh, what students think and their ideas and so on so i don't see it as completely like Uh, opposed to each other okay. of course the time constraints are there i agree <laughs> so this is a, such an interesting question i mean can we make a balloon go in a straight line so your article mentions how the students responded to your question with a variety of experiments and it seems that they have uh, you know come up with all these ideas on this spot but often in science classrooms the children are usually given instructions on how to conduct the experiment which is aimed at achieving an expected result now when the children design their own experiments with whatever material they can find around what cognitive skills are built wow that's a difficult question to answer maybe for me but uh, maybe coming back to uh, why i posed this question right because that question as i as i mentioned in the snippet the question came because together we observed all of us you know because they showed me how the balloons uh, fly we observed that they fly in very erratic and you can't really uh, it seems as if you can't really predict it will go this way or that way you know? so i was just wondering uh, it was a rhetorical question actually i have to admit i didn't mean that you know they should do experiments this way but the children uh, in fact taught me something that uh, you know be serious about your questions <laughs> and they were more serious about the question right? they immediately started doing things um but yeah i agree in a typical experiment kind of thing uh, you know you typically i'm just trying to think in a school situation maybe children are introduced to uh, structured experiments probably in 10th grade you know 9th or 10th grade structured experiments you know this is how this is what to be all the steps are explained and so on so as against children uh, maybe coming up with their own experiments right so what not just i actually many people have been saying this and are still saying this that uh, children are anyway doing that anyway they are doing that so there is nothing that uh, special that we are uh, you know we are introducing here they are already doing experiments in a way 
what was your role in these experiments? I mean, did you give any feedback or did you provide them guidance when they were doing these experiments? Uh, my feedback will uh, to listen basically that is my feedback to acknowledge what they are doing and to suggest maybe a little bit okay suppose you do this little not too much so not mm -hmm. suggest too much but to acknowledge what they are doing and to kind of in fact uh, children would come and uh, show me that is what happened that day they tried stuff on their own one of them would you know pull me to their group and show me you know this is what we are trying i don't know they felt the need to share also okay so there were uh, as you mentioned in the article there were different groups and different experiments happening in the class so how did you keep a track of you know what each group is doing and what the, what was their thinking behind that particular choice of exploration right so it was very difficult actually so uh, in fact uh, i i you i have to admit that i i used to be scared to walk into a classroom of very young children i'm still scared in a good way scared in a good way because uh, i am interested in what they have to say what they have to show me and what their ideas are but as an adult i feel inadequate to respond to each and every idea mm -hmm. first and of course to match their energy levels also so i in purna i used to uh, request one of my colleagues you know to come along with me to just help somewhere to facilitate but uh, yes it is a challenge to listen to each and every group and make keep a track of what everyone is doing but i tried my best moving from group to group and so on so as i mentioned in the in the snippet at the end we uh, sat and i uh, we some sometimes i try to show other groups what others have done then we wrote down on the board what we saw in very short sentences so i try to kind of uh, kind of bring things together at the end but my uh, throat was hoarse by the end of the class <laughs> they were too excited yeah yeah and also you suggested that in the process of testing these ideas the students often stumbled upon and explored other unexpected phenomena now again what was your role as a teacher there again to just bear witness that's i mean uh, when children are can be so creative what you can do as an adult is to legitimize their efforts by acknowledging what they have done and by uh, helping them share what they have learned with their uh, you know with their classmates or something like that so beyond that uh, and of course by uh, by being there to listen to what they have to say and uh, since you mentioned cognitive early on in the first question yeah. here it was uh, it was difficult for me to separate that cognitive aspect with their emotions i mean they were so involved and uh, in fact one of the groups in which they were do they found something completely different that whole excitement of having found something completely different was so obvious and apparent they were jumping literally <laughs> and uh, because they found that they could make water spray around okay when you uh, fill a balloon partially with water and then fill air in it and throw it up it goes around and sprays what i mean that was completely unexpected and uh, so i would say that that affective angle that emotion that angle is very important <clears throat> because that's what keeps you know don't have to be uh, jubilant and exhilarated all the time but uh, that connection with something that you are doing which you feel you mm -hmm. i don't know it's like important to uh, sustain the engagement with whatever you are learning no? true 
No, uh, you shared in the article that uh, that one of the group students arrived at a way of studying balloons flight almost. Now we haven't tried this ourselves, but many of us are very curious to know, know how that experiment worked in studying the balloon. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Could you please demonstrate it for us? So actually, I'm in a room right now, but I have a few balloons. And in fact, thanks for asking me that question because today morning I started playing with them again, and I had a good time. <laughs> So basically now here I have uh, put a tape and tied up and a thread, stuck a thread to the balloon. And I found this thing, this uh, ice cream, uh, whatever, stick, ice cream spoon. And I stuck it to it and I tried to see what happens, etc. But unfortunately, the space is not there. Mm -hmm. But maybe everyone can try this at home. But what I found is this, okay. Uh, uh, that day, the children, uh, I would say most of them were successful to some extent because mm -hmm. successful is also what I don't know what is whether that's the right word to use, but because they were able to uh, make the flight of the balloon less erratic. So, uh, I don't know. So, over here, this is a very long thread that I have used. Okay, so it weighs down on the balloon, and the balloon kind of can't go here and there too fast. Then I then maybe it, it'll be nice if everyone tries this out and better to use the same thing. So basically here I shouldn't be using the ice cream. If I'm using ice cream sticks, I should continue with ice cream sticks, right? I shouldn't change. But I found these uh, sketch pen uh, covers and so one one idea was to uh, have a, a shorter uh, string and see what happens. And then I was trying to see whether the place where we stick the mm -hmm. balloon, you know, is it closer to the opening or somewhere in the middle, if that matters. And it does, did seem to matter. One of these, the balloon was going around like itself also. And then in one of that, uh, the last one, I just got rid of the string and just directly stuck that cover to the to the uh, balloon so i mean there are so many things to discuss and in fact i'm going to discuss this with my colleagues in physics that there are so many phenomena involved here that uh, this can become an interesting context to learn physics even at maybe higher secondary or even at undergraduate level i feel and in fact uh, since i started looking for uh, papers people have written people have written papers on balloons and there are a few you know, very interesting papers about uh, and readable there are these uh, art, um, what is this uh, the physics teacher right there is this mm -hmm. journal called the physics teacher uh, then there is this journal from the UK called physics education many interesting uh, articles and uh, papers on balloons so I'm sorry I'm not able to I should have maybe uh, recorded some video but that is fine man. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not able to demonstrate. But I wanted to share that. Please, uh, everyone, please try out these things with balloons. So many things to be learned, actually. Yeah, I think the viewers of this video might do something of this sort and they can share it with us what their experiences were. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned that in the article, you used a mobile device on the blackboard to record and share the different experiments in class and invite the students' thoughts around them. Even a while ago, you mentioned the same thing. See, this is so simple, it's very interesting. Why is the documentation of student work important? Yeah, yeah, I mean, actually, it's a very important question. Although documentation is a word that not many people like right it sounds very like bureaucratic scary uh, also. yeah scary also like something official or something like that but uh i'm sure more many teachers do this and many uh schools also encourage their teachers to do this that to write down the insights from their teaching practice and uh, to identify uh things that worked to identify uh ways of teaching that uh, didn't work also maybe you know or maybe some experiences with children um, that suggest that we need to do more work on something on cert certain aspect of learning or something like that something that children are finding 
uh, very difficult to engage with something that children are very attracted to and we need to take uh, you know pursue this forward so documentation uh, for want of a better term uh, documentation is very important and uh, in fact uh, uh, we spoke about documentation in the previous uh, webinar right and yeah. documentation is a way is an in, very important aspect of uh, certain kinds of pedagogies uh, you mentioned the board reju emilia last time yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially the Reggio Emilia approach that um, really uses documentation to uh, inform pedagogical practice. And in fact, not just inform pedagogical practice, to do some kind of um, in-school uh, continuous professional development of teachers. You know, like you keep on reflecting on the documentation together. You come together and... Uh, look at something interesting that happened that week, and think about it, discuss about it, and uh, you know, grow as a group also. And the new teachers kind of get into that kind of mode of working that you know you start you discuss what you saw in class and uh, share your excitement and your uh, sadness also, of course, if you fail. You know, but you help each other grow and uh, uh, teach. Uh, you know, improve your teaching practices and so on. Yeah. So definitely, documentation is an, uh, very important and need not be boring. Actually, it can be very uh, exciting because uh, it can become a context to uh, start uh, or have a conversation about teaching and learning. Besides a utilitarian aspect of documentation helping us to improve our uh, Mm -hmm. uh, teaching learning. Yeah. So, uh, reading about the events that unfolded in response to your question so is like seeing the processes of science in action, like uh, designing simple experiments to investigate a question, working collaboratively in groups, and exploring different possibilities, you know, trying to find explanations for their observations, etc., etc. So interestingly, you uh, described that these children of grade four as being spirited and creative. You know, often teachers say that the children lose this as they come to middle and high school. Mm. So in your experience, how can this be sustained? Right, right. Actually, again, this is a very important question and very common uh, observation that uh, people make, including us. But I'm just wondering now whether, you know, instead of blaming children or even teachers, I don't want to shift the blame on someone else, but uh, there's so many systemic pressures, right, to do things in a different way at higher grades. So uh, uh, I don't know whether, you know, I still believe because I have seen it happen with even adults, even mm -hmm. like with the teachers that we work with and so on. Uh, people have wonderful ideas, questions, and uh, they do great things. Uh, children are probably less inhibited to actually uh, try it out and to say it. Um, with uh, slightly older children, of course, adolescents and so on, sure. so they get more self-conscious probably, and apart from the systemic issues of exams and so on, all that stuff, expectations and so on. But um, I would say that uh, I don't remember. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I probably yeah. This is in the NCF two thousand five thing, right? That um, in the middle school till middle school, at least children should do experiments and uh, get to experience the world. You know, look uh, around them. Starting from EVS to middle school, uh, you should actually build familiarity with phenomena and ideas. And then at the high school level, you want to do something more abstract, more uh, like towards theory building. But even theory building can be done in a uh, while uh, conserving the creativity and spiritedness of children, probably. Uh, but I'm just wondering when I should I, uh, is this a good point to share? Because I wanted to talk about uh, an educator uh, and her ideas. Uh, an educator who really inspires me and uh, 
should can you can we have like two minutes to talk about Eleanor Duckworth's ideas? Yes, yes, please, please, please. Okay. Because this, uh, I think this. Uh, uh, so Eleanor Duckworth uh, was a student of uh, Jean Piaget. Uh, Piaget, the cognitive scientist, who is known for uh, many of his uh, you know, work, a lot of his work on uh, how children think, how they learn, etc. So uh, I just wanted to uh, share some. Um, so since uh, I'm sure men, most of most people have heard the term constructivism, and constructivism in the sense that, uh, uh, as opposed to the usual way of teaching, which is a teacher lectures and uh, the student listens and that's it. Only only chalk and talk. Talk, right so there is a space for there is a uh, i mean chalk and talk traditional uh, lecturing is important it's not it should not be discarded it is important in its own ways but if we consider the nature of learning if we think about what is the nature of learning then constructivism uh, which is probably more than a century old already the idea of constructivism uh, says that knowledge can't be transferred from the teacher's head to the student's head. The student has to kind of make, build, construct their own understanding of whatever is being discussed in their own way and construct it in a logical way and you know, build it actually. It can't be transferred, just lift it and put it in the student's head. But the student has to actively make that, uh, make that kind of, uh, uh, what is it called? That construction of that knowledge. So constructivism, if constructivism says that um, uh, knowledge, you know, for example, I'll just share this, uh, this uh, uh, some slides. Huh? Uh, where is this? Yeah. Yeah. So are you able to see this? Oh, it hasn't come on the screen yet. Yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So Duckworth uh, poses this question. So if knowledge must be constructed by each individual, then what is the role of teaching, basically? And what is the role of the teacher also? No? Yeah. So then, and she gives two uh, two points to know what could be, how can we think about teaching in the light of constructivism? No? So one thing that she says is, um, to put students into direct contact with phenomena, the and not the not words about the phenomena, not the not words or books or lectures about what we are talking about, but the thing itself. You know, whatever we are studying, if it's a poem, then you give the students the poem itself. You know, not your interpretation of the poem, but. If it's uh, science, it's if it's about say some phenomenon in science, you uh, help children uh, engage with that uh, particular phenomena itself directly, mm -hmm. and uh, and okay, so that is one to put students into direct contact with phenomena related to whatever is being studied, you know, the real thing, and and then to help them notice what is interesting for them, what uh, puzzles them, what questions they have, you know, to ask them to speak about and think about what, you know, what do you, what sense they make of it mm -hmm. and, uh, and keep coming back to it. And the second aspect is, now this is very different, I think, from traditional teaching, is to have the students try to explain what sense they are making. And instead of explaining things to students, you you try to understand what you know what sense they are making. I mean, this is uh, this is very different, right? And uh, um, first step is to uh, make students like keep put students in direct contact with the phenomena. If we are talking about balloons, you know, you are directly students are playing with balloons. You know, they are actually experiencing it. And what she uh, the or what would be an ideal situation for me would be after having played with the balloons or while playing with the balloons, children uh, talking about why they are, you know, what they have seen, 
why do th- why do they think something is happening what their ideas are you know what sense they are making about whatever they are seeing and not the teacher explaining things to them you know this is uh, x y z you know this is how things are to try to understand what sense they are making i mean this is very different uh, from uh, the normal explaining things and uh, when i actually i just wanted to sh- say that um, i'm sure like we just um, in many of our workshops also with teachers you know we have many and with other not just teachers others also like people say that are we uh, if you know the answer why don't you tell the answer right why do you have to make people uh, say you know get uh, get it out of them you know if you know the answer just tell it right but duckworth says that this is not this doesn't help just telling is not doesn't help because it's been seen that just telling is not enough just telling something is not enough it doesn't really stay with the person only when the person the learner constructs things themselves for themselves does that knowledge become theirs right and uh, stays with them so duckworth says that if you yeah fine i know something about it but if i just tell that if i just tell the the answer then it will just stop the process of learning it will stop any further thinking about uh, that phenomenon or so on Okay. and she feels that uh, the role of the teacher who understands the subject matter is to pick the right kind of phenomena the right kind of questions the right kind of context for learners to engage learners with the right kind of context means the context that is rich in questions and learning and so on so that is the role of the teacher facilitator that's what duckworth uh, says so i felt like mentioning this okay avinay so we can continue Um, yeah. I'll stop sharing for now. I guess this is why uh, maybe we should try the demonstration of studying the balloon on our own and explore all the factors. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, your article leaves us with the fun images of students playing with balloons, experimenting with water, sand, pencils, and discussing things with each other. Now so sometimes. Uh, this might seem like utter chaos the classroom might feel so now could you tell us how you manage the class such that the such such a chaos facilitates rather than disrupts learning right right actually i i uh, can see what you are saying and uh, conventionally speaking such a class would be called as a unruly class right because everyone is you know jumping around doing different things and so on but uh i i'm not able to remember who said this but uh so uh i think it was einstein is it i don't know whether it was einstein that someone remarked that some their desk was very uh, untidy you know so okay. uh, and they compared it with some other desk which was very tidy and you know clean nothing was there in it so so if an untidy desk uh, signifies a mind that is i don't know if someone says this is a scattered and unruly whatever you know uh, chaotic huh? then the empty uh, desk signifies an i mean an empty <laughs> mind right probably so uh, so i just wanted to say that i agree that conventionally it can there can be many uh, difficulties in uh, managing such a class but as long as i think the teacher believes that their students are uh, you know doing something important interesting and the grown ups teachers facilitators of course you need more help one teacher and so many children every group doing something different and uh, very difficult to manage but if there is some help it should be given for such a class more people should come together to facilitate such a class but it's important to listen to uh, children's ideas and to understand what they are doing and what is their motive behind doing what they are doing you know what uh, why are they doing that what what do they think of what they saw what they see or what they are trying to do why that understanding their sense as the coach says is uh, an important aspect of teaching learning i think okay 
So uh, in continuation, usually we have been uh, hearing about you know, reducing attention spans in children. But in the article, the students try out several variations to make their balloons go in a straight line. Now, this perseverance seems surprising, you know, especially considering that we often read that you know attention spans are being reduced in children. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions of how this can be cultivated and encouraged? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I wish I would I knew the answers, but I don't know the answers. But Duckworth says something interesting. Duckworth mm -hmm. says that if the question or whatever you know subject matter you are the students are engaged with, it's uh, challenging enough, uh, which respects their intelligence also. Mm -hmm. And uh, the framework of teaching learning is such that you trust that your students are intelligent human beings and they will have some ideas that are relevant for this subject matter. Uh, then I think uh, people are engaged actually, even grown-ups and even uh, young children. If they find that context, whatever subject matter uh, engaging, uh, challenging enough in a way that there is something more to learn in it, right? There is something puzzling. There's some, in fact, Duckworth also says, uh, what is the role of confusion? Mm -hmm. What is the role of confusion in learning? And a uh, little bit of confusion, little bit of play, little bit of uh, postponing, uh, what she says, postponing conclusions. Postponing certainty for some time. You know? That kind of tentative space is important for this uh, deep learning. So uh, uh, I think the context, that is our job as educators, as teachers, to find a context that engages our students. Because otherwise things are very fragmented, right? Yeah. Especially with media and so on, right? Very fragmented kind of experience. Hmm. While well, reading the article, I wonder, uh, sorry, yeah. uh, if so, this is a kind of a little longish uh, quote, but I just uh, someone suggested that I just keep it on the screen for a while because Duckworth mm -hmm. says that this kind of learning in which people talk about their ideas and the teacher listens to those ideas. This kind of learning, teaching and learning is in, interesting, important. And she gives some reasons for that. And I just want to share mm -hmm. that for a minute. You know, is that yeah. fine? Okay. Yeah. So it's a long quote, so I will not uh, read it. I'll just leave it there for a minute and then we can all read it in silence. Yeah, it's on the screen. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, Vinay, maybe I'll stop, but uh, yeah. uh, I just wanted to share this before we go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Anish. Let's see, while, look, while reading through the article, uh, you know, there was quite ease and informality of your discussions and interaction with the students. But in some schooling contexts, a teacher may struggle with establishing such a relationship with students. Do you see? that uh, this has any impact on the learning experiences? Right. Again, a very important question, Vinay, actually. But I believe that in most places, teachers and students have wonderful relations. Most places. 
even uh, i mean even the kind of uh, schools which are struggling in terms of uh, infrastructure in terms of uh, teachers and so on most places i feel i would like to believe that teachers and students have a wonderful uh, relationship in spite of all the difficulties the relations between teachers and students are uh, really good i would say but in terms of scale it matters because if you have a big class mm-hmm. and you want to reach out to every each and every child in that class it's a very challenging thing um uh, but in terms of informality i would uh maybe some children are not very uh, uh comfortable talking in front of everyone but they will come and meet the teacher later maybe and tell them what they feel or what they questions they have or what ideas they have so on so um but uh, i would like to uh, think that yes teachers and students uh, should continue having authentic conversations in the classroom so like we talk to each other about uh like right now we are talking to each other right i mean with that kind of ease if teachers and students are able to talk to each other but there are many uh, systemic challenges to that probably but uh, but i would like to believe that in most places teachers and students enjoy a healthy and very good friendly relationships yeah so no, sometimes uh, you know it also happens that some of the students are a bit hesitant to participate in this experiment or discussions so were there any of such instances what yeah, would you yeah, suggest actually, yeah yeah actually to be available maybe the teacher should be available to all children right even children who don't want to uh publicly kind of in public participate like uh may may not be comfortable so maybe we should allow them to uh, participate in a different way maybe outside of class or maybe have some quiet time with them so but i agree with you that the teacher should be on the lookout for to engage each and every child to find out why a certain child is not speaking up what is going on <laughs> in their mind maybe they have something interesting to share but they don't feel uh, feel like talking in front of everyone but yeah the teacher has to be on the lookout yeah i agree okay so you also speak of how the direction of the experiments and the decisions that students made reveal some implicit ideas that they hold and their conceptions as well could you please elaborate on this and how did you recognize the more implicit aspects of student conceptions yeah 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 so actually this was in retrospect huh, vinay that i mm-hmm. was think that day when i went home i wrote down whatever i saw i took a photo of the blackboard also i wrote down what i saw i had those videos which unfortunately got deleted but for some reason but uh, but i wrote down whatever children show uh, showed me what they tried out and so on and i thought about why they might have tried that you know why did the child feel like okay a pencil is kind of straight so maybe it will go straight something like that but most of the ideas involved adding some mass mm-hmm. increasing so, so the mass of the balloon somehow because they knew that typically it's more difficult to kind of change the way an object a thing is moving when its mass is larger and somewhere that that idea is there implicitly mm-hmm. but in fact that idea may also be coming from an aristotelian framework also right it may not be like the right idea what we expect them to have in terms of newton's laws etc in terms of inertia as galileo proposed it and so on but still uh, th- these uh, the fact that most of the efforts involved adding some mass to the balloon mm-hmm. pointed me to the fact that they have some uh, you know notions from their everyday experiences uh, from they were like fourth grade so 8 9 year old children so from whatever experiences they had in their 8 and 9 8 or 9 years those everything was playing out maybe in that 
so that in that way i was thinking that yeah they would have some implicit ideas about inertia maybe in some way mm-hmm. for me but uh maybe if i had a chance to talk to them more about why did you do that why do you, what do you think is happening here you know some um it would have been more apparent what exactly why did they do that maybe they would also not have thought about it explicitly they would have articulated it in the process of explaining to me why what happened why they did it what they saw what it means and so on so so these observations the connections that you are trying to draw between you know the expected and notions and the conception the students hold these seem to come from a depth of subject matter expertise do you have some suggestions for teachers who are still developing this expertise in a subject or a topic i really don't know what to say about this but uh, i think uh, my interest is coming from uh my interest in the history of science because how people develop these ideas in the first place mm-hmm. right no one kind of struck upon it at the first effort right there was a process back and forth over centuries and millennia perhaps right to yeah. arrive at what we have as the finished product of science today so uh, as an educator as a teacher uh, we keep on uh, reading we keep on discussing with our uh, uh, colleagues and sharing and uh, you know we are i mean we uh, for example uh, just few weeks back uh, me and my colleagues we were working with a group of teachers on uh, we were working on motion and uh, force okay? and um, it's not it's never that it's never the case that uh, you have learned everything about something right you always uh, as you mentioned you always discover new connections with what you learned so for example the connection that i uh, realized which i had not made until 2 3 weeks back was that uh, if you are aware of uh, how galileo came up with the idea of acceleration that you know some what is acceleration he in a way defined acceleration because he felt the need to show that an object is not moving with a constant velocity right so uh, he defined acceleration and mathematically also which was very different but when you go to newton's second law newton is defining uh, force as mass times acceleration newton is drawing upon galileo's work on acceleration right that we forget actually so i had made that connection ah galileo defined you know found that acceleration goes as t uh, square of t t square in his work on the ball rolling down the inclined plane and so on but um, so uh, newton was able to draw upon that idea of what acceleration is to come up with his second law so that connection i had not made so i'm just like what the point i'm trying to make is that we are always learning new things by interacting with other people by talking by teaching also is a way of learning right so uh, and yeah that's and especially the history of science i think is very rich in uh, these connections i think yeah. so usually some may argue that uh, learning becomes more concrete when learners recognize these implicitly held conceptions and articulate them so how would you respond to this yeah actually that's exactly what the poet is saying that uh, implicitly explicitly acting out what you feel what your hunches are about something what uh, how do you understand things uh, getting the chance to talk about it is an important step uh, in learning and unfortunately we don't get that chance too much because like you and me can discuss uh, on a, a movie that we really love right do we get that kind of chance to discuss uh, something in science that i mean we uh, it's very important i completely agree with that, that 
to be able to articulate it for yourself also not mm-hmm. just to share it but that is a very important step in uh, learning and especially probably learning science and uh, would there be any steps the teacher could take to build this ability in the children or yeah actually i feel that teachers themselves need to experience the thrill of engaging with subject matter in a fresh way mm-hmm. i mean once teachers are you as teachers uh, as a teacher experience that satisfaction of understanding something and finding the connections appreciating some beautiful idea or uh, way of thinking about some uh, phenomenon or concept once you yourself as a teacher experience get to experience it i think only then you can uh, share that with your children and also make space for your children to experience things uh, with that kind of uh, satisfaction right so uh, i think it's a big challenge that all of us as, as educators uh, we should be taking up that uh, of course discounting the systemic issues that you know that other larger problems are there that also need to be fixed yeah so you mentioned in the article that uh, these ideas and conceptions i quote uh, happen to be just adequate for most student efforts to be moderately successful no since one of the groups was actually able to study the balloon's flight no some readers may wonder what you mean by moderately successful yeah i was just being very modest maybe i didn't want to claim that this was a very successful class that way you know i mean children tried out ideas but more needs to be done i just wanted to say that uh uh more needs to be done because uh they acted out their ideas mm-hmm. in an ideal situation uh i i actually did that to some extent on that day in those 40 minutes i when i shot the videos i showed them what they what they were doing and mm-hmm. i was and they saw it actually and maybe mm-hmm. and they worked on worked further also on it so in fact this so called documentation helps the learners also actually to take their ideas forward so um, uh, i didn't want to say that it was a ex- immensely successful and wonderful class i'm just saying that uh, these processes t- uh, need to be taken forward and uh, just doing is not adequate right i mean you need as we just discuss just before this question like we need to articulate what we understand and what meaning we make out of it uh to take things forward right to move towards more uh, you know more holistic more uh, in depth understanding and not just stop with the doing but uh, move forward from there also. okay uh, how important is this success in these kind of explorations yeah children want to be i mean everyone wants to be at least a little bit successful no? if everything would have been would have failed would be very disheartening you no know? <laughs> i mean it was nice that they were able to do this on their own literally no almost no help maybe little bit of nudging here and there that you know uh, some use a smaller rubber you know piece of uh, eraser whatever little bit of uh, suggestions but they would not take all of my suggestions also you know they even within the group of 3 4 children they have their own uh, uh not fights but arguments about you know what should be done and all that you know but they would still make progress it's not like uh, they would keep talking and not do anything you know? they are doing but still but there is more involved here whose ideas get accepted who gets to try it out i mean most of them were working with their friends so they got they didn't get you know uh, dominated or anything like that so uh, Uh, but i would say some moderate success is important right but you need time and uh, uh, you need that uh, trust also that things will work out and things do work out most of the time something or something you find something you work out, uh, kind of comes out of it now what we make out of it how do we take it forward 
is the challenge actually and i think uh, uh, ideas from people like duckworth and uh, maybe now vinay if you don't mind i would like to share something else also because yeah, uh, there was this uh, person called david hosberg uh, who influenced a lot of people especially in south india uh, to work on uh, education and to think about uh, who worked in a uh, rural school who actually was part of rishi valley but uh, he made his own school also small rural school called nilbag and it's uh, very uh, beautiful work and he has written some books on science for primary school children based on his experiences and i i want to share some uh, a quotation from the preface of uh, these books because i thought it's relevant to what we are discussing right now how do approach science how to approach science how do you uh, learn science uh, so i it's a very short quote so i'll uh, share my screen okay uh, and maybe i can read it out it's okay you know i think that helps okay so david hosberg's uh, it, he starts with saying that before the child can be led to any important concepts of science it is important to break down certain concepts so he's saying that there are some, some misconceptions which we need to break down before we can get children to engage with science huh? so what are these misconceptions so the first misconception is the idea that the textbook is some kind of divine writ to be accepted without question swallowed without digestion and regurgitated in the examination so that's his first thing that he thinks that this has to be broken down that textbook is holy there is something more i mean there is knowledge and textbook is not the final word uh and the next misconception according to him is that for every question there is one correct answer and only one correct answer and that at that this correct answer must always be given in the words of the book mm -hmm. and i i think that's an interesting thing point that he's making here that you listen to you know the, stop this uh, obsession with the right answer the right answer the right answer no listen to what children have to say there are more things also and another misconception is that every effect everything that we see every phenomenon that we see is due to only one cause only one this causes that you know but typically in science even in these balloons you have so many different factors coming working together you know you have you have uh, you know the elasticity of these balloons it's really strange kind of elastic properties of rubber actually s curve actually stress strain curve then you have uh, uh, you know uh, the slight increase uh, the air inside it is at a slightly more in a higher pressure than the uh, atmospheric pressure. it's not like it's very huge pressure difference is not very huge actually then you have the buoyancy itself little bit of buoyancy then you have the drag that the balloon experiences it's actually something called turbulent drag okay uh, that the balloon experiences then if the balloon is spinning then it will experience that kind of force that your uh, you know the fast bowlers uh, that magnus force that mm -hmm. uh, Uh, you know you get when you have something that is also going around many very interesting physics involved here actually with the balloons also so typically you know anything that you see any phenomenon is not due to one cause and not as so often happens to a multiplicity of causes many things are involved you know, that's the nature of science that's what he's trying to say here you know it's not as simple as you know although the textbook might be saying this leads to that If you go in depth, there is always more to learn and understand and uh, appreciate and, and so on. Okay? And then he says, "Okay, after having broken down these misconceptions, what can we do? How can the teacher break down some of these? Uh, no, how do we? No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. How do we actually break it down? That's what he's saying. How do we actually break down these uh, fall fallacious concepts?" Okay? so he says the way out is to encourage by encouraging the ch child to ask questions to conduct experiments for himself and to make guesses right so in a way i find it resonates with my experience with children that day 
because uh, the children did their experiments themselves right and did they guess something yeah implicitly they were guessing maybe uh, did they ask questions i wonder maybe i should have listened more carefully what were their questions so but he saying one way to break down these misconceptions about uh, what is how to learn science and what is science is to encourage children to ask questions conduct experiments for himself to make guesses by given by giving children plenty of practice at suspending their judgment right suspend your uh, conclusions you know just wait postpone that certainty for a while just wait suspend your judgment for a while and being prepared to wait and observe rather than to jump to quick conclusions i think it's a beautiful suggestion and then he says finally and even by the teacher and the pupils occasionally saying together we don't know followed by let's find out so i thought this was very relevant uh, uh, into our discussion horsberg's uh, ideas and of course he's written a, a many interesting things and arvin gupta's website has uh, some interviews and books made by david horsberg and so on so i'll stop this sharing thanks yeah that is quite interesting nanish um while in the article you also mentioned that how some student ideas about inertia and motion are more aristotelian than newtonian could you please elaborate on this aristotelian notions of motion right. and how actually, the teachers can uh, differentiate these two right right actually i also have aristotelian more notions because in my everyday life it works for me it works i mean if i had to move a an object uh, more if i have to move a chair i have to push it less hard if i have to move a table i have to push harder to move it right so actually but taking this forward and taking it taking this common sense idea of motion uh, uh too seriously is problematic mm -hmm. because uh, uh but it took millennia two millennia for us to understand that it is problematic because aristotle uh, like we have mentioned in the uh, snippet you know people can read up more about aristotle's uh, mechanics um, it's very interesting actually it's really interesting it's not to be discarded actually it's to be appreciated too just because we want to go to newton's laws doesn't mean that aristotle's ideas are not interesting or important because they speak to our everyday experience actually that uh, if you want to make something move faster you have to push it harder right so aristotle's uh, law of motion would be a force is proportional to v the force of force is proportional and f is proportional to a so uh, it speaks to our everyday life but only when we articulate it only when we uh, express what we feel will we be able to problematize it as uh, galileo was able to and question it and see what are the problems in it and uh, see why galileo's ideas of inertia acceleration superposition you know all these ideas that galileo invented and discovered and made Uh, and of course newton's laws which build on these ideas to appreciate that we have to go through this we have to accept that yes our everyday uh, notion of motion is this uh, given as given by aristotle it helps us actually it's not to be discarded it helps us but it's not sufficient it's not adequate to explain so many things so we have to really engage in that process of uh, thinking experiencing talking discussing problematizing finding some things from history that how did people think about it how did they do question this and so on. so this process has to be enjoyed and appreciated and uh, so in that sense i wanted to talk about uh, i don't want to go into all the details of what exactly are aristotle's laws of motion here but it's very interesting very very uh, wonderful lecture you tried this activity of balloons with grade 4 students uh, i know it has such interesting results and the other teachers may want to try it with their students as well but uh, at these grades uh, wouldn't newton's laws of motion are a bit too advanced 
How would you respond? Yeah, probably. To this? I agree. Actually, even uh, I wonder whether even when we introduce Newton's laws of motion the way we do uh, to eleven grade students, uh, we have to build sufficient background to get to Newton's laws. But what we can help children with in uh, say fourth grade students or younger students or little older students, what we can help them with is to experience these phenomena firsthand, directly, okay. and uh, to uh, express what they feel about what's going on, you know, and so that they are already they already have their own ideas and questions articulated. By the time they reach 11th grade or whatever, 10th grade, they have something to draw on, right? They have their own, uh, you know, stuff that they reference first-hand experiences and ideas uh, to refer to when they learn and appreciate Newton's laws, right? So now they have something and now Newton's laws is helping them to look at that experience in a different light. And they, I think they'll be able to understand Newton's laws uh, the beauty and the depth of Newton's laws if they get a chance to experience phenomena and to talk about them, to uh, express their ideas about maybe wrong ideas also, what wrong in that sense, inaccurate that way. But at least those mm -hmm. ideas have been spoken about, you know? at least they have said it, they have articulated it. So I would think of it that way. So you also mentioned in the article that uh, systemic and persistent efforts are needed to introduce students to the idea of inertia in the way Galileo corrected and replaced Aristotle's idea of natural motion. Uh, why are these notions so persistent and what could be you know, suggestive pedagogical approaches to deal with such uh, right. conceptions that students could? Right. Actually, why they are persistent is a very deep question and people are still trying to understand this. What people have understood is, is that it's very persistent. It's like even after doing a master's in physics or even further, these ideas stay with you. No, you won't give them away. Maybe one reason is that they are still useful in our everyday life, those Aristotelian ideas. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, um, how do we go... How do we address this? No, So I think people have tried out various ways. One was the so-called hands-on way, right, from the 60s and 70s, doing experiments. But then people realized that doing experiments are not enough You for you know, all the work on conceptual change, that to really uh, change the concepts, you had to, maybe one way is to uh, see, uh, let, you know, help people see the contradictions between their own ideas, you know, that some kind of cognitive dissonance you, cognitive conflicts. Yeah, conflict you uh, create. Another way people have tried is uh, the history of science to see how people, others have been over the centuries thinking about these ideas and to uh, that. But I have to say something that every time you are with a new set of students or learners, you have to really see who is who are these people whom you are working with as a teacher and what their ideas are to decide what will work for them, right? So ultimate decision is with the teacher that what approach should be taken you know, based on the teacher's experience and hunches and understanding of what might work here and so on, right? Because after all, it's that relational aspect of teaching, right? Mm -hmm. Teacher is understanding whether their students are engaged, whether they're following, you know, what, what seems to be working, you know, all that. So teacher, of course, has to be on their toes and uh, fine, but has to have all these uh, different uh, ways of working, maybe ways of uh, strategies or whatever, what you want to say mm -hmm. to in their arsenal to kind of take out when they think, huh, this might work now. Let me take that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then document it and reflect upon it if they were written. Yeah, it worked yeah. Or absolutely and share it with others about their insights will be useful to other people around the world the other important aspect that comes out of this article is where you mention that this hands-on exploration seems to be 
related to the emergence of the social aspects of learning. So what do you mind mean by these social aspects of learning? Could you share some examples of it? Yeah, here just in this particular exam uh, anecdote itself, the children working with balloons. One was that they worked in groups. You know, they found it. Oh, someone might have started by themselves, and other children joined them, saying, "Ha, this is interesting. Let me work." And probably that uh, us typically being very social, some people are asocial. It's fine, but most of most humans are social. We want, we derive our energy by interact. You know, we derive our uh, kind of motivation to work and to do something more through our ex our interactions with students and others, right? So uh, I meant social aspects of learning because uh, what Duckworth says in that long quote that I shared, you know, uh, students learn from each other, yes. perhaps more than what they learn from the teacher. Also, some people say, <laughs> but uh, uh, so this learning from each other is a big. I mean, today it's a very big thing. This whole peer learning and all that. It's a very big uh, area of work that people are, you know, trying out. So uh, the social aspects, actually, I wanted to learn. Maybe I didn't discuss it very clearly here, but I meant that uh, from a maybe I shouldn't throw more terminology, but uh, from that social cultural point of view, you have the cognitive, you have the cognitive kind of uh, theory, right? You have mm -hmm. Piaget, and you have that kind of thing. But which probably looks at how children learn, what do they think about something, so on. But uh, the sociocultural theory uh, approach from Vygotsky and others says that it's uh, not just about the learner and the subject matter. It's about the context also. It's about uh, how do you uh, get even the words to express what you are thinking. Now, what are the tools, you know, the mental tools that you have to uh, even articulate what you are saying, what you what you are feeling, you know, and that you participate in that some child, you know, for example, in this particular uh, situation, suppose there is a child who is new to the school, right? The child mm -hmm. hasn't learned how to talk with other children in the school, you know, what kind of common words they use, you know, what kind of expressions, what kind of cues they uh, draw upon to kind of, you know, say that I want to say something, you know. So how do you participate in that community of learners also is a is something that you learn. You slowly start from the periphery and then you learn how to participate in that community also of learners, right? So from that sociocultural point of view, uh, the social aspect of learning, a child participating in this activity also, right? How does that child participate? How does that child share their ideas and try out something in a group. I mean, that is something very interesting, I feel, which should, needs to be understood further. Of course. Okay. But uh, in some teaching learning spaces, these aspects may also reveal deep and often unspoken social divides. Okay. Some teachers who try this approach may see this as being a challenge. Would you have any thoughts or suggestions on this? Very, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very challenging, very challenging because various aspects, uh, I mean, caste, class, gender, I don't know what else to say. I mean, it's very, uh, there are, we are in a very unequal society and not everyone gets to participate. Whose uh, ideas get listened to reflects the kind of society we are living in and so much just shows us some that so much work needs to be done to address these inequities. So, uh, but it's important for a teacher to be aware that, you know, for example, uh, typically a girl student in a group of boys would get dominated. I have even seen uh, a woman teacher being dominated by men teachers in a small group and uh, you know, not letting them, not letting uh, the woman teacher um, uh, do an experiment in a group, you know, some like in a teacher workshop. So, uh, so is it better to have a women teacher to get teachers together in a group than you know, uh, let them being dominated by a 
uh, male teacher you know i'm just wondering you know these are not easy answers but but to be sensitive to be aware that these things exist is definitely important and uh, should one uh, a teacher and educator should have these things uh, should consider these things while setting up such kind of learning yeah so while speaking about uh, this whole experience on one hand you mention the social aspects of learning on the other you speak of students taking ownership for their own learning rather than being passive so do these two aspects of learning social and individual connect with each other and with the process of science and so what role would teachers play in facilitating this both aspects i don't really know whether they can be uh, separated actually thought of separately uh mm-hmm. but on one hand i see what you are saying maybe that you as a teacher want to know what every child is learning you don't want that child's voice to be drowned in the collective whatever <laughs> uh you know there might be a dissenting child also right who might be feeling something different you know no no i feel no, this is not the way this is it should be done this way so for a teacher it's important uh, to make sure that all voices are heard and uh, it's a difficult question to answer in terms of science given the nature of science given how complex phenomena are but uh, still having that faith in a way that you know uh, your uh, teacher uh, having faith in the intelligence and efforts of their students that they will make progress you know they may not uh, reach the right answer but they will make progress and they'll stay engaged with the subject matter and at what point the teacher wants to intervene in some way or the other that is the teacher's uh, judgment pedagogic uh, judgment but um, uh i don't have an answer actually when it's a complex question <laughs> yeah but maybe it can be uh uh organically it can be dealt with organically i feel just that the teacher has to be aware of these aspects somewhere the teacher has to be reflective that so many things are going on yeah so uh there was an interesting point that you mentioned in the article so i quoted from the article so okay. the way students moved around the class while being it pointed to the pitfalls of treating teaching learning as a purely cerebral activity so uh, what do you mean by saying teaching learning as a purely cerebral activity yeah actually is maybe uh, sometimes we are too concerned we we are too caught up with uh children learning the right answer and getting them there that we forget that you know the body exists right i mean you are not just a mind sitting in a desk or sitting uh, you know uh, on your whatever desk in school uh you are a person who uh it was not just listening and speaking you know just there is you know this whole body i mean you can be tired you can be excited so in in terms of children moving around um i mean uh, i meant that okay we forget that children experience the world in a different way than mm-hmm. adults adults can maybe sit like this you and me and just <laughs> Yeah. So while speaking about it, you mentioned that uh, Ramendra Tagore outlines the pitfalls of this cerebral pedagogic approach. Could you please elaborate on this? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So definitely, I should uh, recommend uh, re- this book written by Elmhurst, who was uh, Ramendra Tagore's uh, secretary, uh, and Elmhurst himself uh, was part of all the work. at uh, shri niketan shanti niketan all that tagore took up and elmhurst went elmhurst went back to england and started his own school also 
that's another mm-hmm. story but elmers has a book because elmers used to nag tagore that you know all your writings are in bangla uh, no we can't read bangla what about others so uh, so elmers made kind of interviewed tagore and uh, so there is a i forget the title of the book is it tagore on education or something like that but the but the uh, again it's on uh, arvind gupta's website Uh, you can find that book and so one of the essays is the role of movement in education okay. mm-hmm. in which tagore is talking about his interactions with children and how he sees how children express things with their whole body it's not just a you know only the mouth talking the child is actually sure telling a lot with their whole body and he gives many examples of what uh, you know uh, how Uh, children need that movement, and I mean Tagore's whole—I uh, mean his story of his whole thing with formal education, right? He hated it, right? As an engineer, but he rebelled as a poet, and then he also created an alternative, right? So it's nice to engage with Tagore's ideas, uh, and this particular book, Tagore on Education, I think. So pioneer in education, I guess, the title of the book. What is it called? Sorry, Pioneer in Education. Yeah, Tavinara Tagore, Pioneer in Education by Elmhurst. It's a beautiful set of essays. It should be read. It, uh, it hasn't dated. It's very relevant. So, uh, teachers may wonder how they can facilitate teaching learning processes that go beyond uh, being a cerebral activity to one that allows for a feel for phenomena. You seem to suggest that uh, Seymour Purport's ideas on constructionism may be useful in this regard. So could you please throw some light on what constructionism is and what are the connections yes. that you see with it in a classroom? On one hand, Vina, actually now I feel that many people are saying the same thing in their own ways. Okay, so we can see the connections between uh, even Duckworth, Tagore, and Purport. so semor papert's uh, idea of constructionism uh, i think early 90s or late 80s he uh, articulated it he says that okay uh, by then people had come to uh, take constructivism seriously that you, mm-hmm. it doesn't just happen that you transfer knowledge from the teacher to the student you know student has to really work on it make these concepts and articulate them question them re- recreate that have some conflict that is needed that people had already started realizing that constructivism is needed but what papert uh, how he interjected is that he said that uh, uh, he said that if there is something tactile there is something material that people uh, not always actually but most of the times that you can touch feel manipulate change uh reorient use it in a different way you know this thing actually helps people think mm-hmm. so in a way uh this uh having some material of some sort that can be manipulated changed molded used in a different way this actually helps people think also construct also their ideas or take their ideas forward and that's uh, although papert is known for his work on computers on that lego on uh, not just lego sorry uh, what was that Lo- logo was sorry uh, what's it logo the turtle game right turtle that came okay. in the early 90s that children moved that turtle by writing small programs and all that so uh, but uh, but uh, papert's legacy is the mit media labs which uh, mm-hmm. is taking these ideas forward this uh, uh constructionism and so on it's uh, i think it has many insights to offer and what is the role of this uh, tactile kind of uh, phenomena in the construction of knowledge this is something related to the scratch programming that the the dev recent yeah they that. are the same that's the same group yeah. yeah scratch also is based on that philosophy of constructionism although it doesn't have anything material like to feel but you have something that you can change it's not a 
it's not like a formal you know science experiment it which can only be used in one particular way but here is something say for example scratch this uh, block programming uh, that yeah. we children do in scratch is something that you know the children can move about those blocks use them in different ways and mm -hmm. so there's something that can be changed molded manipulated so that that was his idea that you want something that you can use in your own way uh tapper's idea yeah thanks for the scratch yeah the other approach that you mentioned is the engineering design uh approach so is this different from construction is it what is but it again, maybe it's the same thing perhaps with the <laughs> but people uh, generally some people call it in a different way maybe that you you uh, you uh, throw a challenge that you know make a structure out of newspapers as tall as possible you can only use newspapers you cannot use glue you cannot use rope nothing mm -hmm. so you give this okay. challenge that you know make her as you know you have as much newspaper as you want you know you have to make the tallest structure so you throw this challenge and then children will work and even adults for that matter will work on it and they will come up with something and typically mm -hmm. when people work in a group it works out nicely i have seen and uh, you give this challenge and people will make something out of it and now the 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 challenge for the teacher or the educator is i think to now make uh, okay you have various ideas say of making a tall structure using a newspaper huh? getting people to reflect on it and think on it and take it further you know that is the challenge i think yes. making but making is immensely satisfying and very uh, you know people are really really engaged in that making also but similarly to keep people engaged in thinking reflecting and continue that making also not just making becoming a just an ice breaker you know but it should become like a integral part of learning yeah so that way i would say that uh, that engineering design a uh, challenges would be a wonderful idea uh, to explore even learning formal science not just uh, yeah and it is being explored around the world i mean i'm not the first person to say that Thank you, Anish, for such an interesting and intense discussion. Do you have any parting thoughts to share? Uh, well, thank you for calling me, and uh, uh, thanks for this opportunity to talk about and discuss these ideas with you. Thanks. That has been quite uh, an experience, actually, listening to this whole conversation that you shared. so uh, thank you anish and all of you who have joined us today if you have any questions for anish that you haven't been able to ask or get a response to please send them to us at uh, i wonder at apu.edu.in we will do our best to get them answered so if you have not yet subscribed to i wonder we hope so that you will do that now so join us again for our next webinar on 9th august 2023 see you there Thank you. Thank you, Vinay.